Uh, this Christmas, I want to do a little takeoff from the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. And instead, I've titled it, It's a Wonderful Christian Life. And uh, you could open up to Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, because that's going to be our text for this morning. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. It says, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve God and money. Let's bow our heads and pray. Why don't we stand while we do that? Father, we give thanks and praise unto you for this time that we've had here this morning to worship you on this day. God, we just ask that you be glorified here as we look at your word. Use this exhortation for good in each one's life. I ask and pray for each one here, O God, that this would be a blessed Christmas time, that as they meet with family and friends over the holidays, that it would be a great time of fellowship and rejoicing, that you'd even do great work in the families of those who have strife or differences going on, that you would bring healing and uh, that you'd start a new and great work in each family's life. And I ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Could be seated. Uh, in the movie <clears throat> "It's a Wonderful Life," George Bailey spends his life doing right. By the way, how many of you have seen the movie "It's a Wonderful Life"? Okay, who has never seen the movie? Wow. Okay, well, I know what to get a couple people for Christmas gifts this <laughs> season. But in the movie "It's a Wonderful Life," George Bailey spends his life doing right. He puts others before himself. He shows loyalty to his family and he puts the greater needs of the family before himself as he's growing up, does he not? Takes care of the uh, loan place. His uh, dad runs while after his dad passes on so his brother can go off to college. Anyways, uh, he later marries and he has his own children and he works hard to provide for them also. He always did right all his life. George never went after money. He never pursued it, even when he had an opportunity to get in on the ground floor of the plastics industry. In fact, he even used a significant amount of his own money to secure the well-being of others and to make sure his father's legacy did not die. Remember the bank run? There he was, leaving on his honeymoon. He had $2,000 to go be with his wife on their honeymoon. And a bank run breaks out. And what does he do? He goes in. And uh, they used their honeymoon money in order to save the building and loan company that his dad spent his whole life building. But things begin to change as George gets older. He isn't the idealistic young man that he was in his younger days. He begins to come to grips with his mortality. He begins to see that not all, in fact many people, have no concern about anything but themselves. The world has begun to pound through with its philosophy of look out for number one. George begins to change. He begins to desire the riches of this world and he has this lingering regret that he didn't get to do those things he dreamed of in his youth. This becomes evident in George's life outwardly when Sam Wainwright, remember the guy who always used to go hee-haw? When Sam Wainwright shows up, One day, Sam is rich, and Sam is the guy who had offered George the opportunity to get into plastics on the ground floor. George sees what Sam can provide his wife with, and this bothers George. Makes him feel a little inadequate, but mostly makes him begin to question the legitimacy of his doing right all his life. That, maybe, he should have looked out for number one, like the vast majority of people do. That he should have believed that the most important person to you should be you, as the world preaches. It was as though the words of Christ in the parable of the sower were coming to bloom in George's life. The deceitfulness of riches and the desire for other things were choking the word in his life. Things accelerate. Mr. Potter the richest man in town, decides to try and buy George off by offering him a prestigious prestigious job with lots of 
and many great benefits. Lots of money and great, many great benefits. George will be able to take his wife to the nicest places and buy her the nicest things. For a moment, George can justify working for Potter and accepting his offer because the God-given desire and design from God to, as a man, provide for his family makes it okay to George. But mostly he can justify it because it fulfills his own lingering desires. George recovers himself, however, and declines the offer from Potter. Finally, things reach a crescendo. After spending his life doing what was right, George, through no fault of his own, finds himself in, of all things, a financial scandal. George is beside himself. He begins to think of all the good he has done and how meaningless at, his, at this point in his life it all seems to be. He blows up at his son when he mentions the neighbor's new car and says, What? Isn't our car good enough for you? He says, My kids might not be the best dressed children to the teacher who's on the phone that he's yelling at. He says um, to his wife, Why do we have to live in this drafty old barn talking about their home? And then he asks her the $64,000 question, why do we have to have so many kids? Things have reached a pinnacle in George's life. He leaves and seeks help from a man who's made his life's ambition the accumulation of goods, none other than Mr. Potter. Mr. Potter helps George to realize he's worth more dead than alive. He's worth more dead than alive because he has no stocks, he has no bonds, he has no real estate, just a life insurance policy worth $15,000 and only has $500 equity into it. Things have reached ahead and George decides to commit suicide. This way his wife can finally have those nice things through his death. He believes everything bad and rejects everything good and it pushes him to this point. He's thinking about what people have said in his mind. How he did good most of his life and how it hasn't paid off and how people, how he's had opportunities to go after those riches and he blew it all every time. Everything that the world says is important in life, he has none of. <laughs> he's been duped. He thought if he did right and good, he would be rewarded. Instead, he is in absolute despair. If only he had looked out for number one, as the world teaches, he wouldn't be in the situation he's in right now. He's a failure in the world's eyes, and now he's a failure in his own eyes. That's the story of It's a Wonderful Life, right? I'll get to the conclusion in a minute. But let me... Um, say this to you. The reason this film is so popular is because so many people can relate to it. That's why it's so popular. Because so many people can relate to it. Who hasn't felt like George Bailey at some point in their life? Everyone has. That's why everyone likes the film. They can relate. Think your life stinks? It hasn't had any meaning? It hasn't had really any impact? You know, you're just one of a million people, nameless faces, wandering around, milling about in life. You can become depressed. You can wonder, what's it worth? What's it all about? Right? You can begin to think, man, maybe I should have pursued the things the world says. Maybe I could have all those nice things, the big house, the nice car, all those nice things for my wife. Blah, 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 blah. My exhortation to you today is, when that point comes in your life, don't take the bait. Don't take the bait. Always keep God first. Always keep Him number one in your life. Because that's the only way you truly will have happiness, is to serve Him first. To keep Him first in your life. Jesus said... No one can serve two masters. You know why Jesus said no one can serve two masters? Because you can't. It's just that simple. 
You cannot serve two masters. We have a Christianity hell-bent on proving him wrong. We in American Christianity have built whole theologies, sold millions of teaching tape series, trying to prove him wrong. Have we not? Somebody tell my son the other day, you know, you need to uh, become a doctor or something. As a Christian, you're supposed to be the head, not the tail. (laughs) Now, how does that theology line up? with the thousands of Christians who've died in gulags around the world. Do you know what I'm saying? The rest of the verse in verse 24 says, For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You can't serve both. I pray if you ever try to serve the God of money and serve your Lord and King, Jesus Christ, I pray that the one you decide that you hate and you disdain is the God of money. (laughs) And that you decide to be loyal and love your King, Jesus Christ. There have been those who have decided to embrace the God of money instead of their King. It was laid out before them, they had a decision to make, and they went with the God of money. And there's many who sit in churches today, all across America, sitting in their church pews, waiting to worship God today, but their God is really the God of money. There's whole churches that have built theologies making money as a God a justifiable thing, baptizing it all in Christian terms. I can relate to George Bailey and how he felt. Take the car situation. He blows up at his son. He says to his son, what? Isn't our car good enough for you? Sam Wainwright shows up. Remember the scene? He's got his nice, beautiful vehicle. And what does uh, George Bailey have? This piece of trash which he has to kick the door to get it open just so he can get inside. He's feeling rather... You know, you could, they captured this so well in the film. There's been times when I sit there, I, get, I remember just a few weeks ago, I got out of my car at the post office, my piece of junk station wagon with the rust, cancerous rust holes all over it. And I got out of it and um, stood there. And when you open the door, the door goes, and everybody in the parking lot always turns to look at you. And so I sat there and I looked at this guy who just pulled up as he heard my door go, and here he's driving this nice car. You know this thing's got to be 40,000 bucks, you know. Chances are the guy's either a wicked dog or a religious lukewarm person. He's riding around in this nice vehicle, and here I am riding around in this rat trap, right? And you can sit there and you think to yourself, what the heck's going on here? (laughs) Especially in the midst of American Christianity, which constantly preaches, if you love God and serve Him, you will be rich, and you will live luxuriously. You're the head, not the tail. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and all the other verses they you know, use for their thinking. I sat there and I thought to myself, man, and this is the thought I had in my mind. You know, if I didn't have all these kids, I could be riding around in a car like that. <laughs> That's exactly what I thought. Everyone can relate to George Bailey. That's why everyone likes the film. Jesus has a different idea about things, though. He says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. That's one of the reasons I like my old rusty vehicles. My Suburban I bought, just watching new holes pop in it every day since we bought it last February. Whoever sold it to us, you know, they just like put some veneer stuff on there. Just long enough for old Matt to walk up and buy this stupid thing. (laughs) But I don't feel bad about it because I always tell my kids now. I always use it as a thing. I said, see, Jesus' words are true. Moth and rust do corrupt. (laughs) Our vehicles, all our vehicles, stand as a living testimony (laughs) that what Jesus said is true. (laughs) So we should be happy about that. 
He says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Amen? Amen. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Hallelujah. Many children are good. I don't regret having many children. What would I prefer to have? Isabel, Darby, Tralick, the one in the womb, Sarah, Josh, Jeremiah, Crispin, or a nice piece of shiny metal? (laughs) What would I rather have? I'd rather have my kids. I'd rather have my kids. You know, um, I won't have any Social Security when I get old because I opted out of the system. They let the congressmen and the um, clergymen in this country do that. That ought to raise some suspicions in your minds right there about that whole system. But I have all these kids, amen? Amen. And I teach them about the fifth commandment, honor your mother and your father. And one of the things that are in there, that's taught there in the fifth commandment, all the rabbis taught it, Many Christian theologians that I've read teach it. One of the main things that's being expressed there is caring for your parents in their old age. One of the important aspects of honoring your mother and your father. Well, what if you don't have any kids? Or what if you stay single? Then what do you do to take get taken care of in your old age? Well, then you have money. (laughs) Children cost money. So you don't have no money usually when you have a bunch of kids. But if you don't have no kids, then you got money. So go invest it properly, and you'll be taken care of in your old age. It all works. My point is we can get by without Social Security. People did it for hundreds and thousands of years. Isn't that an amazing fact? I remember talking to Congressman Sensenbrenner about how people in our church were having a hard time getting their money back for their income tax because they didn't have numbers, social security numbers for their kids. And he's responded by saying, oh, how could this country survive without social security numbers and social security? So I had to remind the good congressman that the country did fine for 150 years without social security numbers. And people did well for thousands of years before that. Did they not? Amen. They survived. People can get along without Social Security numbers and Social Security. So I'm glad I have all my kids. I'm glad that I have them rather than the nice piece of shiny metal sitting in the driveway. It says you cannot serve two masters. That's what Jesus said. Someone was telling me about their pastor about a month ago. He's a millionaire. And um, built their own, built the church building that the church meets in. The church building can seat about 800 people. There's about 100 people in the church. He was telling me how his his um, pastor made a phone call just the other day and made twenty thousand dollars just like that in the stock market, just like that, twenty thousand bucks. How much money he gives off to the missions and things like that. I sat there and I listened to that and I'm like, that's not right. Here's a man who's a pastor who's supposed to be devoting his life to Christ. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. There's a problem there. Something's not right. The world's program is, look out for number one, secure your future. Then go ahead and serve God. God's program is Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. How many Christians do you know who say, I'm going to go get rich and then I'll serve God, and I'll be able to fund my own ministry? I know tons of them. You know how many I've seen accomplish that? Zero. Never seen one yet pull it off. Not one. That's because it's contrary to God's program. God's program is, seek me first and I'll take care of all this other stuff. I'll get you the things you need in order to be clothed and fed. 
That's how God works. And uh, man seems to not like that idea. He wants to work it out his own way. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. Finances and money should be peripheral incidentals. They should not be up here. You know, this whole thing about, I've been thinking about this whole thing about stewardship. God wants us to be good stewards. You know, the Bible says precious little about us being good stewards. It's one of those theologies American Christianity has concocted to justify their um, building bigger barns, you know, to keep their things. You know, my mom inherited some money when my grandma died. And for Chuella standards, it was a, it was a large sum of money for, for uh, our standards. And my mom has said to me, I don't know how many times, my life was so much simpler when I didn't have that money. Because now she feels responsible for it, makes sure she maneuvers it properly so it, you know, is there for the future and all that. She said, I like, you know, I lived a happier, simpler life when I lived paycheck to paycheck, she said. (laughs) I didn't have all this nonsense to be concerned about. That's what Christ is saying. He's saying, I'll meet your needs. Take no thought for tomorrow, because those things will take care of themselves. If you're a man, you know, you want to get good things for your wife, nice things for your wife. That's what what you want, right? To get nice things for your wife. I think most men just want nice things for themselves and the wife is a nice excuse to get what they want. That's what I think. The end of the movie came along and George didn't die. Clarence the angel leaped into the water and acted like he was killing himself so George would leap off the bridge and save Clarence the angel. And then what happened? Clarence takes George and lets him see his life, what it would have been like if George had never lived. Because George, you know, I wish I was never born. Everyone's probably said that at some point in their life. I wish I was never born. I remember when my dad was ready to give me the belt when I was a kid. Boy, I wish I was just never born. (laughs) I wouldn't have to feel that thing coming. So he gets to see what his life is like, what life would have been like if he had never been born. And what does George Bailey realize? He realized what the important things are in life by seeing what the world would have been like if he wouldn't have been born. He realized that even when you do what is right and good, It seems like it's all for naught, but it isn't. But it isn't. You never know how many lives you've touched, how much effect you've had in this earth for your king. Amen? Amen. You never know. And so we need to realize that there is no other way we can truly be happy than to serve Jesus. We will be miserable. I pray you're miserable. And I thank God it is so, unless we put God first. We're to put God first. Amen? He's to be the driving force within our heart and within our life. We should be laying up treasures in heaven, not here on earth. Because where your treasure is, Jesus said, that's where your heart will be also. Serve him, put him first. He'll guide you in your life and he'll meet your needs. Your physical needs will be met. You're not to make a priority of you making sure your physical needs are met. No. You're make serving him your priority and then your needs will be met. Sounds insane, but that's what you're supposed to do. That's what he says to do, Amen. Now, don't go crazy or something like that. I've met Christians, thank the Lord, far and few between, who sit there and say, well, God says I'll supply all your needs, so I'm just going to sit in my room and seek Him and not go out and work or anything like that. Part of serving Him is your work. 
You need to know what work it is he wants you to do. That's exactly right. It's part of your priestly ministry unto God. Amen. Just put him first in your life. Amen. Focus of your life should be serving Christ. Amen. So let's keep him first. And um, everything else will be taken care of. Let's stand up and we'll pray.